Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. It's March 2nd, 2015, which means it's the eve of trade deadline day. One of the biggest days for Flames fans every year. And as usual, it's me alongside Matt. How you doing, buddy? Good. Quite a week for the Flames. Lots of news, lots of games. Um, Let's start with last week. Didn't really go the way that we expected it to. The Flames didn't have a great New York trip. Lost to the Rangers, lost to the Islanders. Managed to be the Devils. What are your thoughts on the last week? Well, I can't blame any of it on the goaltending. Kari Ramo has been absolutely phenomenal for the Flames between the pipes this week. He only surrendered one goal in each of the New York games, and unfortunately Calgary couldn't respond at all with any offense. So, not much you can do. I thought if... I thought at first they were playing Ramo so much just because they were trying to show him off to make a trade, but obviously they weren't. Well, he has actually posted the best stats of any goaltender in the entire NHL on the road. So, why not? If he performs that well in that situation, why not run with him? Keep playing him. Yeah. Well, I'd be curious to see if he's going to get re-signed by the Flames or not. I would kind of be doubting that, but who knows? There's a lot of time between now and July 1st. So the Flames are almost halfway down their New York road trip now. They've got four more games left, um, three of them this coming week. And just as an interesting note, this is the ninth time in franchise history we've had a seven-game road trip, and only twice have we gone 500 or better on those road trips. So that's not, I mean, that makes sense. You're on the road for so long, but that's not a promising stat. No, it's always difficult to play that many games in a row on the road. Usually if you're just going on a one or two games road trip, you can focus better. But, you know, you're in hotels all the time, airplanes, this, that, the next thing. It's hard and even though the flames aren't really traveling that much distance wise to the three games thus far it does get a little annoying after a while yeah and it's nice they've had the three games off this week or the three days off before their next game so that gives them some time to relax um let's uh we have an a uh, special guest co-host tonight someone who's joining us from the fireside chat family you guys have heard him before He's one of our one of the producers of the show and one of our editors, Mike Crosby. Mike, how you doing tonight? Good. Uh, thanks for having me, guys. You're welcome. We wanted to bring you on for trade deadline day and have you discuss some what's going on with us. Yeah, looking forward to it. Well, before we get to trades, why don't we talk about the captain? Um, unfortunately, the Flames placed him on the injury reserve yesterday. We found out that he's out for the season with a torn bicep, and Treliving told us that it's going to be about a four to five month recovery time. Obviously, this is going to hurt us. Uh, Matt, what are your thoughts on this? Well, anytime you lose the best player on your team, it, you're going to have a hard time. And it really is disappointing that for the second time in five years that Giordano has suffered a late season injury that's knocked him out for the year. I hope that the young defensemen that are on the Flames can try at least to fill the role a bit like as brad Treliving said today you can't replace mark giordano but hopefully all the younger guys can step up a little bit to try to take some of the edge off mike do you think this could cost the flames their playoff shot uh, it's certainly possible. Uh, I was saying, look at the standings. We're at 70 points right now. So assuming that uh, 94 is the threshold to make the playoffs, we've got to go uh, 12 wins out of our next 20 games. And yeah, without our number one defenseman, it's going to be a little bit tricky to do. I'm not convinced that it's going to be impossible, but it definitely hurts our chances and really hurts our chances if we do make it into the playoffs. To me, the worry I have is the defensive depth um you know obviously bringing in schlemko helps but it's not like the forwards where we've got all these guys that are waiting for a shot and we know can all play there 
really we've got Corey Potter and Watherspoon, and that's about it. So I'm worried that with Gio, Gio out, we might not have a lot of guys to replace him. But I'm glad the Flames didn't go out and make a rash move today to try and replace Gio. I was worried that they might go out and overpay for uh, one of the defensemen that was on the market and end up mortgaging the future because of that. So I think they've managed expectations well. But yeah, I agree with both of you. I think it's going to be tough to get in the playoffs because of it. If we do make it in, it's going to be tough to go very far. Um, And I think that we definitely need to see players step up. And if we're going to do that in any year, this is the year to do that, don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm curious how the defensive pairings are going to look now, too. That's a good point. Matt, who do you think gets moved to pairing one with TJ Brody? I would expect Raphael Diaz and bump TJ Brody down to the second pairing and make Weidman and Russell the de facto first pairing and just kind of cycle through everybody. Interesting. So by that, we've got Weidman Russell as number one. You're saying Brody and Diaz as two? Mm Mm-hmm. And then who's your third pairing? Uh, Probably Schlemko and England. And everybody can, like, all the third guys can just cycle through and with Brody. Okay. How would you do, Mike? What what would you do for the pairings? Um... Well, I, I'm not too sure. Uh, any word on when Smeed's coming back, or do we get him back this season at all? I don't. I haven't heard of when he's coming back. He's skating, but that's yeah. It might be a week. It might be two, three. The rest of the year, who knows? Yeah, um, I think if it were me, I would uh, I would bump Russell up onto the first pairing with Brody. Cause I think their styles would complement each other pretty well. They're both like smooth skating puck moving guys. Uh, I don't know who I would put with Weidman, probably Schlemko and then just keep the third pairing as is with England and Diaz. I just looked it up. Uh, Lottie Smead was put on the injury reserve on January 20th and he's estimated to be out for 16 games. So we're probably not going to get him back if we do till late this month. Okay. See, I think, I don't know, to me, I like where you guys are going with those pairings. I think the way Weidman has played this year, I would give him at least a shot on pairing one with Brody. I think he's the veteran guy. I think that, you know, he we've seen him play some good hockey this year, especially offensively, and maybe this is what he's going to need to kind of bump his game up and show us that, what he's got there. So I think I would at least, for the next game, put him with Brody on the first pairing. That's one of those things you can't really, yeah, there's no set way of doing this. It's trying to just find whatever solution will work to get you through the game. (laughs) So with our captain out and Glenn Cross gone, this means that we need another letter. Um, Obviously, I'm not going to put a C on somebody, but who do you think is going to take the extra A? Lance Boma. Matt, who do you think? You think Boma gets it? Mike, what about you? I'd say uh, Monaghan. Monaghan? I think, you know, I was looking at those guys. I was thinking I'd probably put it on Hoodler because he's a veteran guy. Um, Going deep because I don't think he's wearing a letter right now, is he? No. No, so I'd probably put it on him this year and then reevaluate next year and look at a Monaghan, a Boma, uh, some of those young guys. But, yeah, I could see it on any one of those three. I think they're all good choices going forward. Um I think Buma has definitely played hard this year and maybe really earned it where that's not the kind of guy we'd probably expect to be an alternate. But he's definitely shown some heart this year. Yeah, absolutely. Um, before we get to trades, a couple more notes. One of them's uh, some recalls the Flames have done. So today, uh, Poirier, Furland, and Granlin were all sent down to Adirondack. I think that's just a, a move so they don't count against the call-up limit. And instead, Drew Shore was recalled from the AHL. So he will be one of the four non-emergency call-ups the Flames are allowed to do for the rest of the year. Matt, you probably know this. Correct me if I'm wrong. If he plays one more game, he's eligible for waivers, right? Yes. And Poirier, Furland, and Granlund were actually sent to Adirondack and will be remaining in the AHL. So... Okay. Yeah. Uh, Raymond and uh, Stajan will be back out. So, uh, adding Shore to that, that's your 
lineup post trade deadline. Yeah, and Shore's probably just there to shore up, huh? <laughs> shore up um, some depth because yeah, you you always want to carry a couple extra guys. I don't think, and I'll ask you what you think, Mike. I don't think that we're going to see them use nearly as many young players as they have in the past after the deadline because we're trying to push for a playoff spot. I don't think we're going to see them just auditioning every young guy we can think of to bring up like we did last year. Yeah, well, I think it depends on how good or how bad we look with Geo out indefinitely. I'd be curious to see if maybe Drew Shore rides the press box for a while just because they might be nervous about making him waiver eligible but I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't know. I think if you're worried about making him waiver eligible, there's other guys. Like, why not keep Granlin here? Yeah, that's a good point. Or keep Poirier here. Like, I think, you know, if you're looking at, if you're looking at, well, let's bring this guy up, but maybe not play him, I would probably just bring up a guy who's not waiver eligible who's played well, but maybe that's why I'm not the GM. Well, I think they have every think, intention. I think they have every intention of bringing Shore in to play him and like he's just going to be one of the flames from now on yeah well and I think too that might put some pressure on him for next year coming into training camp because I, I can't see him sending him back down after the deadline and you know trying to expose him to waivers but coming into training camp next year you could say to him all right you're one of the guys you're off waivers so earn a team or earn a spot on the team or you're out of here yeah you know like we don't want to lose you to waivers so I'll trade you for something because I, I don't think that he would clear waivers, especially in the in the preseason. What do you think, Matt? No, not at all. He's too good for that. What do you think, Mike? Yeah, I agree with Matt. He's going to get claimed by someone. Yeah, so I think it might be a little bit of a pressure move on him, too. To, okay, we, we you know we're, we're using your last game. We want you to, to think of yourself as a pro guy now. Show us you've earned it. Hmm. So, interesting moves there. Um, I think Watherspoon also got sent down. Is that correct? Yeah, he was sent down a few days ago. Okay, but Corey Potter is still here. Yes. So Potter and Slimko will both be carried then. So it'll be it'll be interesting to see who slots in where. Um, but hopefully, hopefully Slimko can step in and do some good stuff on the blue line. And a couple couple other farm team notes. Um, we know we've talked in the past about the move from Stockton to Adirondack for the Flames farm teams. So it's been announced that the Adirondack ECHL team will be called the Adirondack Thunder, and they'll be using Stockton's old Thunder logo with some minor tweaks to it. The biggest tweak, I guess, that's noticeable is that we now have a red-headed Viking on the logo. I guess they're just trying to get them flames colors, but I think it looks kind of cool, but a lot of people have been making fun of it. Mike, do you have any thoughts on it? You saw the logo today. Yeah, I, I saw it. I like it. I think it's cool. I mean, it's the same logo he just has a red beard instead of a blonde one yeah they've tweaked the font a little bit too and i think the font's a little bit more modern which i like and matt what do you think you've seen the logo Eh, it's a solid minor league logo it's not you know like the rockford ice hogs or you know something stupid like that so it's all good Looking at the color scheme of the logo, it's kind of got the black and the red and the yellow and a little bit of silver in it too, I think. I wonder if they'll either A, bring back the old silver Adirondack jerseys they haven't sold and use those, or get the ECHL team to use Flames uh, jersey templates, which I always hate it when farm teams do that because it takes away their originality. I was kind of hoping they'd go with something unique. And we haven't seen the jersey yet, but just looking at the color scheme, I have a feeling they'll probably wear Calgary jerseys. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd prefer an original jersey, personally. I think a flaming T would look kind of ridiculous. Well, but, you know, I mean, even even when we saw, like, Adirondack, or not Adirondack, Abbotsford, sorry, take the flame jersey and put the silver on it, I thought at least they were doing something different with it. Mm-hmm. True. But, you know, design is it's lazy, so... You know, they don't have the finances to hire an actual de- jersey designer, so... The worst one was when the St. John's Flames wore the flaming seed. You guys remember that? No, I don't, actually. Okay. When our farm team was in St. John's, they didn't have, like, a flaming ass or their dragon logo. They wore the flaming C. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like the organization was too cheap, so they just bought them in bulk and gave some of them to the farm team. Yeah, there, there's a Why silent not? sea in uh, Newfoundland. That's <laughs> it, It's like, take your jersey with you after training camp because you're going to need it all year. 
Why not? <laughs> they should just really use the practice jerseys. There, problem solved. There you go. Well, they'll need practice jerseys too. So take them both with you. Yeah. Um, speaking of the AHL teams, we have some finalists for the names announced for the Stockton team. The Flames did a naming competition. And obviously the fans there want to name them similar to the Flames. So the finalists for names, the Stockton Heat, the Stockton Inferno, the Sc- Stockton Scorch, which is in honor of the old uh, Adirondack mascot, Scorch, who only last a few days, the Stockton Fire, and the Stockton Blaze. Mike, of those five names, which one are you hoping the Flames will pick? Oh, got to go for Stockton Scorch. That would be great. Just put the mascot right on the jersey. Yeah, exactly. Have that goofy looking puck head on the actual jersey. <laughs> It'll inspire fear in the opposition. <laughs> Do you guys remember Peter Puck, the like hockey Hall of Fame mascot from when we were kids? Yeah, I do. There's this like cartoon puck guy. You could just make him like on fire. <laughs> as much as I think the fans want Scorch, it's the Flames they're going to be picking, and I can't see the Flames picking Scorch. Well, I hope they do. It would be funny. It would be. I'm glad we're not going to have Flames because I always hate it again when a farm team has the same name as the major team. Yeah. I hope absolutely. we don't get Heat because we've already had a team called the Heat. Uh, fire sounds too close, so I'd be okay with the Stockton Inferno or the Stockton Blaze. I like Scorch, but I can't see them taking it. Uh, the Inferno uh, actually is a women's league team that I do believe is owned by the Flames, so they might not go that direction either. Yeah, they've already got a logo. So, who knows? We'll see. But those are the five names, so I'm sure fans will uh, hear the one that the Flames pick soon. And, yeah, I would not be surprised if we have three teams wearing the same jersey template now since the Flames own all three. I think this is the first time the Flames will own an ECHL team. Oh, boy. Fun times. We'll see. Well, should we move on to the main event, gentlemen? Yeah. I guess so. NHL trade deadline 2015. Before we actually jump into the, uh, the actual trades... Mike, I know last night on Twitter, you were saying you wanted the Flames to make a whole ton of trades. You wanted England to move and a whole bunch of guys to move. Are you disappointed by the volume we saw? Yeah, well, I would have liked to see some more trades, and I was a little disappointed about the Berchi trade, but I'm sure we'll get into that later. Um, I wasn't necessarily hoping for a ton of trades, just the appropriate trades. Like, if we don't intend to re-sign Kari Ramo and Gio's out for the season, I assume they knew that headed into today. Why would you not try and move him for something? Yeah, uh, that's a good point. I think part of the reason that they're probably keeping Ramo is the audio injury. I think that probably changed a lot of things. Not having another goalie in the system, who's going to be your backup then? Yeah, good point. The only thing I could, and I talked a little bit about this, but I could have seen them move Glenn Cross to Chicago for like Andy Ranta, bring him in as the backup, and then have... um, have you know ramo go somewhere else but there's a whole bunch of things they could have done so mike on a scale of let's say one to ten ten being the best how would you rate the flames over the last 48 hours um i'd give them a solid six six and a half i mean i think the two moves that we made in retrospect will look pretty good uh it's just there's more we could have done i think and matt what about you I would probably go a little bit higher at a seven and a half just because they managed to get rid of a disgruntled player at, in Berchi and get a quality asset for him. It's not an ideal situation, but at least they didn't squander the opportunity. Well, that was the weird place that the Flames are in, which not a lot of teams are in, is they don't really want to be buyers, but they also don't really want to be sellers. They don't want to buy because they don't want to give up what it would cost to acquire. And if we looked at this deadline, it was no different than other deadlines. The price were crazy. But they also didn't want to sell because they're trying to go to the playoffs. So I think they were in a really weird place that not a lot of teams find themselves in. And I can't blame Trilliving for kind of standing pat. Well, the thing is that a lot of the players have term left on their contracts. So, like, say you were to wanting to trade Matt Stajan or Mason Raymond or Derek England or Ladislav Schmid. Well, they're still going to be here next year. There's still going to be a trade deadline next year. 
So there's the draft, there's the trade deadline, there's lots of chances to move some of those guys with terms. So why rush it? Exactly. And you're going to get an asset for them cuz they are they are legitimate NHL players. So yeah. It's you would like it to be done today, but that doesn't necessarily make sense in terms of the team, especially with the playoff push still being there. Well, and I and I, I think, I don't know what you guys think, but I think that with the cap going down next year, it's probably a lot harder to move a guy with term right now, too, until we know where that cap's going to be. True. Yeah, it's a good point as well. Well, let's break these moves down one at a time, kind of in chronological order. Let's start with the Flames' first move of, I guess, we'll call it deadline day, even though it happened yesterday, and that was the waiver acquisition of Dave Schlemko. Uh, they're bringing in a defenseman, a defenseman who's very well known to... Uh, Brad Treliving from his time in the Phoenix organization. Um, a guy who I feel is a lot... I mean, he's a friend of Russell's. They played together in Medicine Hat, but I feel is sort of like Dave, uh, like Chris Russell in that he really hasn't been given, I don't think, a proper shot up till now. Obviously, things didn't work out in Dallas. He wasn't playing a lot there. Um, and Russell wasn't really a top-flight defenseman until he came here. And got another chance. So why don't we start out with our guest, Mike? What are your thoughts on Dave Schlemko? Yeah, well, I mean, you can always hope that he'll turn out to be the next Chris Russell. Uh, although he was, I think, the seventh D man in Arizona, and then Dallas got him on a waiver claim, and then they waived him as well. So I mean, I'm not expecting a ton. I didn't know too much about him. I've seen him play a couple times, just Coyotes games, and uh, you know, I didn't see anything particularly bad or particularly impressive. So. That's good for a defenseman. That's what you want a defenseman to be. Uh, we'll see how he works out here, I guess. You got to be happy if you're Schlemko. You've been to two teams this year, neither one who wanted you, both of whom gave you away for free. And then to hear, you know, great things from True Living, great things from Russell, that's got to really start you off on the right foot with the Flames organization. Well, yeah. a couple of years ago, um, in 2010, 2011, Schlemko had 14 points in 43 games. And while he hasn't had that kind of an offensive outburst since then, he does have some offensive talent. So with the Flames system and how they utilize their defensemen, this would pretty much be the perfect spot for Schlemko to audition to try and take a spot for next year. For sure. And even if he doesn't turn into Russell, even if he can be a solid you know, five, six guy next year. Cause he is a UFA at the end of this year. So even if he can be a solid five, six guy, I think he could definitely be worth keeping around. He's 27. He had some veteran presence, I guess, to the blue line. while we're giving guys like Watherspoon and Seeloff a couple more years to develop. If we decide to keep him around. The one interesting thing that, uh, I, th there's actually less depth of than there used to be is, uh, he's a lefty. And it's funny, we've been making this big push to get all these right-handed defensemen. And uh, yeah, so it doesn't hurt to have somebody extra that can play the left side. And I think he'd probably end up being an improvement over, you know, Engeland or Diaz, one of those bottom, you know, five, six guys. Yeah. Well, and I don't think you're going to necessarily move those contracts, but it's, it's kind of interesting. The Flames were, if you think about it, the Flames acquired a rental player but gave up nothing for him. I mean, his contract ends at the end of this year, which is the definition of a rental, but we paid nothing to rent him. Yeah, and people paid more for uh, rental depth defensemen this uh, deadline day, so. Well, that's it. You almost got to wonder if he was out there trying to shop him again. Like, hey, you want, you know, look at what some of these rental guys went for. You want to take him off my hands? You want to take Diaz off my hands? There's another guy that could have been a rental, but yeah, I think it's kind of interesting the Flames did end up acquiring a rental if you think about it in the end. Yeah, and he gets 20 games to see what he's got, and then if he can play well enough, he'll get another shot next year. So, Do you, do you think that Schlemko slots into, let's say, at least half of those games? I think he would uh, take over the current number six, and like instead of Corey Potter, and see how I it agree. goes. Yeah, I think this has probably made Potter's... I guess, NHL shot, if you will, with Geo down, 
cut short because yeah i think schlemko is going to be one of the top six for sure yeah now the other thing that we could try just because with geo out if we want to replace him essentially by committee and roll seven defensemen few less minutes for yeah. everybody yeah well i think that'll probably depend how everyone's playing too mm-hmm. um but yeah i think i i like schlemko he's he's got a bit of grit to his game which i think we're missing a little bit on the blue line right now he from what I I mean, I haven't seen a lot of Schlemko, but I've gone back and watched some old games. I've watched some footage online. This guy seems like a Daryl Sutter style defenseman to me. What about you, Mike? Um, <laughs> you know what? I can't I can't speak from experience just because the last time I remember watching him in a game was probably a couple of years ago. What do you think, Matt? He's not huge, but he's got a little bit of grit. He's almost to me he looks like a Lance Boma on the blue line. Yeah, that's a decent comparison. He, he's not going to wow you, but if he can come in and do a solid job, we'll see. Uh, I'm familiar with him a little bit from years past, but like everything, things can change. So I haven't seen him play this year, to my recollection, mm-hmm. so I don't know if he's on a downward trend or what, really. This year he played five games, five games with the Stars. He was uh, zero points, and he was even at zero plus minus. Before that, he played 20 games with the Coyotes this year. One goal, three assists, four points, and a minus five for his plus minus. So not not a great year, but we also don't know who he was paired with, where he's playing, how many minutes, anything like that. But he's six foot one, 190 pounds, and he's an Edmonton boy, so another Western Canadian kid. Yeah, and well, he's still young too. He's only twenty-seven. So exactly, he's twenty-seven. Even if we were to you know sign him for one more year, um, but I think it's nice that he is a rental because we can decide what we want to do with him at the end of the year. Well, shortly after the Schlemko pickup, the Flames also announced I think the player that we all knew was going to move, and that was that Glenn, Curtis Glencross had been traded to Washington. And in exchange, the Flames got a second round and a third round pick for him. Um, I don't know about you guys. This is a lot more than I thought the Flames were going to get. I thought they would be lucky to get a second and maybe a you know B or C level prospect. Matt, what do you think? Were you surprised by the by the return? Uh, not entirely. Once Yarmir Yager got traded to the Panthers for a second and a third, I was thinking that that would set the market for Glenn Cross. And I'm yeah, glad... Yeah, the Met deal sort of set that market, too. True. And I'm glad that he got traded to Washington. He gets to play alongside Ovechkin, so we'll see. And I'm hoping that the Capitals have some success in the, off- or in the playoffs and that he can assist them in their journey. Mike, what are your thoughts on the departure of Curtis Glengross? Yeah, um, well, it's a good opportunity for him. I'm really happy with the return that we got. And like you, I was thinking, you know, maybe it could have only been a second rounder, but, you know, a second and a low level prospect or a third and a prospect. So, yeah, a second and a third in this draft, which is going to be really deep, is a pretty good return. And, yeah, hopefully he does well with his new team. I was really happy when I watched the exit interview to see for a guy who's leaving here, for a guy who's leaving because he wasn't happy, especially to hear the great things that Glenn Cross had to say about the Flames organization and his time in Calgary. And I think that's one more example of why we're going to miss this guy so much because he's he's such a class act. He's, you know, he just to speak the way that he did. I don't know if you guys listened to it, but you can tell there's a guy who really had a passion for the Calgary Flames. Yeah, and that's why it's hard at times to separate the player from the person. And Glenn Cross was a 100% pure class guy for the Calgary Flames. Unfortunately, with how the rebuild is going, there wasn't a spot for him. Because like him, like a whole bunch of players that have previously worn the Flames jersey, you'd like to see them continue to wear it, but... Unfortunately, that's not really in the best interest of the organization long term. And, you know, it's hard when a trade like that happens, but it is for the betterment of the organization long term, even though it sucks for right now. When I kind of look at the roster, 
I think of Glenn Cross as I know that Geo is part of it technically, but I kind of think of Glenn Cross the last of the old regime. The Iggy regime, if you will. And I guess maybe the reason that I've separated Glenn Cross, he's the captain now and kind of the new face of the team. But to me, this almost feels like the last of the old regime leaving. It feels like now we're totally a brand new team after this. What do you think, Mike? Yeah, I see where you're coming from. I mean, yeah, Gio's been around longer, but he didn't really come into his own until after that happened. So yeah, Glenn Cross was kind of the old old face of what we used to be and it yeah it was great having him here while he was here and we turned him from a guy that Edmonton didn't even want to a top six forward for sure Matt do you think that we'll see um Glenn Cross re-sign in Washington in the offseason or do you think this is a, a quick stopover for him uh honestly it's up to him uh, I don't know as if Washington has the finances to offer him a long-term contract yeah, because what's he looking for? Five for five? Something like that. Even if it's four million per, like that, it's. I don't think Washington has that kind of dough to afford him, especially with the cap going down. Yeah, so it'll be an interesting off season to say the least. And though you know the second and third pick, I mean, you know, it's more like I said, more than I expect to get, and I would not be surprised if we see one of those picks parlayed into something else. I think the Flames now have a very good position of strength coming into this draft, and there's a lot of teams that don't have a second now. So I could see one of those picks being parlayed into a roster player in June at the on the draft floor, which kind of gives us one more edge there of having that flexibility to do what we want and make that trade into something different than what it was and give us that flexibility there, which I kind of like to like to think that the Flames have that option. What do you think, Mike? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, we've got six picks in the first three rounds. Um, yeah. we I think we traded away our fourth, but we've still got fifth, sixth, and seventh in addition to that. So there's certainly lots of pieces to work with. I mean, if everything goes right, then you might see us as buyers at the next trade deadline. Yeah, you never know. We'll we'll see. Um, I mean, if you think that we gave up Glenn Cross for, you know, a second and a third, it makes you wonder if we were willing to give up two seconds, what could we get? Yeah, I you know somebody pretty good. I bet. Yeah, I honestly wouldn't want the to see the Flames trade a pick unless you are getting somebody that's like twenty four or twenty five. Sort of like the Nick Letty trade last year, uh, but for the Islanders, that kind of a. See, and I could see, I could see getting that kind of return simply because of the cap going down. I could see us talking to somebody at the draft, saying, "Look, you know, you've got this 24, 25 year old. Maybe he's making three million, which wasn't a lot before. Now that's a lot of money for your four or five defensemen. Why don't we help each other out here?" So an interesting note, and uh, you kind of mentioned it earlier, Mike, Glenn Cross is one of only two guys on this roster who had ever played a playoff game for the Flames. It was Glenn Cross and Giordano, and they're the only guys that have seen postseason hockey currently that are in a flaming sea. So it really is a completely different team that we've got on the ice now. And that's a good thing. Yeah, well, and, and you know, I'm I'm impressed, and I never really thought about this till today when I was reflecting on the Glenn Cross deal and the fact that Geo is really the only old guard left, if you will, um, how quickly the Flames took this Band-Aid off. You know, they decided they needed to make moves, and really the entire old guard, if you will, was gone. Like, you know, all moved. Yeah, there's guys like David Jones that have been around for the last couple years, but that whole old guard, if you will, guys you think of as the Flames' core, like within two years, everyone's gone. And so I really admire the Flames for deciding this is what they want to do and going ahead and getting it done. Yeah, and that's helped massively to accelerate the rebuilding process because there's no hangers on. it. There's no legacy of attitudes in the dressing room, this, that, the next thing. It's a completely new team. It's Monaghan and Gaudreau's team for lack of a better thing. And it's their show now and they get to drive the cart from now on. 
Mike, do you think that perhaps shipping out Glenn Cross sends a little bit of a message to future, say, free agents and stuff that, look, here's a guy who's a good player, but perhaps didn't have the work ethic he needed to be a Bob Hartley player. And if you're going to be here, you've got to be willing to work hard. Yeah, uh, definitely. I think also sending him out sends a message to the kids that, you know, we have faith in them and we think they can put together something really good here. Uh, we've still got that veteran leadership on the team, though. We've got Hoodler and we've got Weidman. Uh, so guys that have playoff experience with other teams. Um, but yeah, yeah, it'll be interesting to see where think, everything goes from I here. I think even David Jones has playoff experience. Yeah, he? he would have played in some games with the Avalanche. And Bullock. There you go. Yeah, Bullock's got a ring. So yeah, I think that to me, like one of the things, I don't know about you guys, one of the things I thought was Glenn Cross' problem this year is he didn't seem to have the work ethic. He didn't seem like he was working as hard as everybody else. And I mean, we've heard Hoodler say in the past that being on a line with young guys has really made him feel younger and up his game. And I just felt like Glenn Cross was a, a step behind. And maybe this is, maybe this is their way of saying, look, he he's a good player. He couldn't compete here. If you're going to be here, be willing to be a Bob Hartley player. Yeah, and that's a good thing. We need an identity, mm -hmm. and our identity is a harding, hard-working team that will bust their ass every shift. And if you're not like yeah. that, then get out. For sure. And then today, March 2nd, the trade deadline. Uh, I don't know about you guys. I was eagerly sitting at work all day watching trade deadline coverage, feeling sorry for the guys in TSN because there was not much <laughs> talk about. Um, and waiting eagerly for the Flames to do something. And we saw one trade, which... I think, I know, Mike, you were saying this earlier off air, but I think our feelings about the trade changed as we got more information. So the the trade that the Flames made was they sent Sven Berchi to our division rivals in Vancouver for Vancouver's second round pick in the 2015 entry draft. And we found out later that Sven Berchi actually told the Flames he wouldn't re-sign here and he asked to be traded. So... Matt, why don't we start with you? What were your thoughts initially on this trade, and how did they change when you found out that Berchi was the one that asked to be out? Uh, I was actually pleased right off the bat. It, it, you've watched the AHL games this season, right? And I have. So have I. Has there been any point in all these AHL games where you go, wow, Sven Berchi really needs to be recalled? Because I don't recall one point at any point this year where Berchi stood out as being a supremely awesome player throughout a game. Like he had a flash here, a flash there, but that was it. And yeah. And not only in the HL, but even when they brought him up, the flames have given him the chance to prove himself. And to me, he hasn't done it. And that's the thing you we've given other players like Josh Juris an opportunity to be in the NHL. I, you know, if you're going off of like reputation or draft pick or whatever, Berchi would get that spot. But, you know, because who is Josh Juris, really? You know, U UFA, NCAA, AA player s signing that, you know, no legacy, nothing, just an, a you know, a last minute add on at, at a development camp. But, the Flames made room for him because he showed that he could play that well. Berchi well, didn't Juris do that. Last year, he was terrible. Yeah, at the times. was terrible in the AHL last year. Oh, I wouldn't go that far, but he wasn't that bad. But he wasn't good. There was no good. reason to think this guy was going to make the team. Yeah, he didn't look like a guy that was going to step in and play NHL. Yeah, but he came to camp and he took the spot. And Berchi, if he would have played that well he would have gotten a spot he didn't it, so at least the flames were able to get a quality asset for him because if you look at uh, next year he would be eligible for for waivers if he didn't make the team well that's how the flames got joe colborne for a fourth round pick so i would easily mm -hmm. rather take a second round pick now than a fourth round pick in eight months for sure yeah. You know, the other thing that I thought, and we talked about this way back at the beginning of the season, I thought it was interesting because Sven Berge was doing a ton of promotional stuff for the team in the offseason. Like he was here, he was doing all sorts of 
public appearances and you know all sorts of stuff and then, and then they gave him a real number and as we know with the 35 and under for Berkey this year I'm like wow he has a number they see a future of this guy and then after all that he just got sent down to the A and I thought he was going to be in the opening roster so yeah I think he's he's made his own bed you know I don't think it was necessarily that he's a bad player I just don't think that he necessarily fits in right now with where Calgary needs to be yeah I agree and it's unfortunate because he should have earned a spot, but he didn't take the steps necessary. And that's not to say he's a bad player. He could easily turn it around in uh, Vancouver because uh, Tra- Travis Green is uh, the same coach he had in uh, Portland when he was in juniors. So when he's with Utica, he'll be able to reconnect with him. Maybe he puts it together. Who knows? But... The Flames have so much forward depth that they have so few NHL roster spots that players that should probably be in the NHL right now are stuck in Adirondack because there's absolutely no room. Well, and you were were mentioning a guy like Juris. I mean, even to me, if I look at a guy like Michael Furland, um, you know, guys that really I wouldn't have expected if we would have had this discussion you know, back in September, October, who would have made the NHL before Berchi and had a better showing in the NHL than Berchi? I thought the Berchi would probably be our number one call-up. I'm even surprised how well Granlin has done this year as opposed to Berchi. Like, to me, he's he's been given every opportunity. He hasn't looked terrible, but I think that there's a lot of guys that have jumped him in the depth chart. What do you think, Mike? Yeah, well, when I first found out about the trade, I was watching TSN all morning uh, following the coverage. And then trade deadline hits, and they're like, oh, we have a trade to announce. Calgary Flames sent Berchi. I'm like, oh, okay, to Vancouver. Ugh. <laughs> for a second. And in hindsight, a second-round pick for Berchi looks pretty good. It's just that this is the guy that we were used to seeing as, you know, he is the face of the rebuild. That's when the rebuild started in, at least in my mind was when we drafted him. And so to give up on him like that is maybe a little bit disappointing, but you guys are absolutely right. He didn't work and he didn't earn a spot with the team. Although I do think when he was called up, I don't recall him ever getting a really great chance. Like I think his line mates were like Stajan and McGratton or something like that. So not exactly a lot of shot to produce. Whereas Granlin comes up and he's centering Johnny Goudreau. <laughs> It's maybe a little bit, but to me scenario. too, that that all has to do with the big picture. Like you know, Berchi wasn't really producing in the A. He wasn't doing probably. I didn't see it, but maybe he wasn't doing well at practice and some of the practice lines. So again, I think they put him probably where they thought he was deserving. I I, I really think that I really think that Sven Berchi is going to turn into a solid NHL. I don't think he's going to be a top six guy. I think he might be a you know kind of uh, six to nine forward. But I think he's going to be a guy that might be around this league for a while. And I'm hoping that whatever we do with that second round pick, whether we use it in a deep draft or we move it for something, that we're going to get a good return from it. Yeah. The only thing that like really scares me a little bit about this is we sent him to arguably our biggest rival. Like, sorry, Edmonton. That was what shocked me, too. Like, of all teams, why Vancouver? And probably just because they made the best deal. Yeah. So if he lives up to his skill set, and becomes a legitimate top six forward, then this trade is maybe going to come back to bite us. But I guess we'll see what happens. Yeah, it's the first time since 1991 that the Flames have traded with Vancouver in the Dana Merzen for Ronnie Stern deal. Wow. (laughs) It's been a while. And, you know, I guess to, to me the best part of this is once we found out he wanted out is we got rid of the two guys who didn't want to be here. Yeah. And even if it comes back to bite us, I mean, I don't want a guy here who doesn't want to be here. And last time we got rid of a guy who didn't want to be here, if you think about, uh, you know, prospect didn't want to be here and Tim Erickson, (laughs) I think we can all say that we've done well with that. I mean, you know, Erickson's floating around. He just got claimed off waivers yesterday and we've got some great pieces out of that deal. So we don't know if he's going to be the next Tim Erickson or, you know, maybe the next star prospect, but to me, when I looked at it, I thought, ah, we, we traded a guy who we drafted 13th overall for a second-round pick. It almost felt like we were losing a bit. But I agree with what Matt said earlier. If I'd rather trade him for a second than have to move him you know, before the season starts to clear a roster space and get a fourth or a fifth-round pick. 
Well, with the second, maybe we pick uh, Parker Watherspoon, uh, Tyler's brother. Cause, uh, in you the, never know. Because he's rated in the mid-40s, so maybe that's how that shakes out. Possibly. Yeah, you never know. Yeah, actually, Tim Erickson turned out really well for us because we managed to turn a guy who didn't want to be here into uh, Wotherspoon, Granlund, and then eventually Smead. So pretty good return yeah, on exactly. that. You know, and I mean, Erickson looked like he was going to be a good prospect when we traded him too. I remember myself being kind of upset that we got rid of him because he was looking like he was going to be, good, be a good prospect. So who knows if, you know, maybe Berchi is going to flounder in a new organization. Um, obviously, he's a guy who thinks he's destined for the NHL. And if the, you know, Vancouver Canucks leave him in the A, maybe he's not going to be too happy with them either. But he could end up being the next Tim Erickson. We don't know. We'll see. Yeah, but no, I mean, yeah, if we can get even one of those two prospects, like a Watherspoon or a Granlund type prospect for um, Berchi, I'd be very happy with that. Exactly, and this year's draft is excellent, so we'll likely get somebody good, especially with how our scouting has been. Pretty much all the top three-round picks in the last five years have been pretty much top-notch. So we should be able to get something good out of it. Yeah. And speaking of which, that now gives the Flames, if you look at their uh, draft picks this year, that gives us six picks in the top 90 this year. We have one first-round pick, which is our first-round pick. We have three second-round picks. We have our pick, Vancouver's pick, and Washington's pick. And we have two third-round picks, ours and Washington's. So that's, I mean, that gives us a lot of options, whether we use them, whether we trade down and get other assets, whether we trade up and use assets, whether we trade those picks for NHL players or other prospects, it gives us so many options having six picks in a deep draft. And I feel like we didn't really give up a lot to get those picks. No. And if you look at this particular draft, there's in the top 90, there's 30 defensemen that are ranked in that bracket. So the Flames, if they wanted to, having six picks, they could use three or four of them on defensemen. And instead of having a weak, weak field of defensemen in our system, you could restock it and have an actual deep defensive system. Well, and I think we could probably all agree that that's where the Flames need to focus now. It seems like we have the forward depth at this point. And even going forward, we've got guys like Bennett and stuff who we haven't even seen yet. But the defensive side's where we're weak. Yeah. Well, I, I agree that we're really deep at center. I'm not as sure on either of the wings now. Like left wing, we've got Klimchuk still in the system. And there isn't really anybody below him unless you're really high on like Agostino. Which I can't say. Poirier's a left wing, isn't he? Poirier's actually a right wing. He's left-handed, but he plays right side. Um, so yeah, and then Flames we've got Flames listed as a left wing on their site. Really? Okay, everywhere I've seen him yeah. is listed as a right wing. And then on the right side, we've got at least I think we've got Poirier, and we've got Hunter Smith. And who knows about Hunter Smith? Because really, that's a guy we drafted because he's big, and that sometimes works and quite often doesn't. Uh, well, Hunter Smith will basically. I'm sure he will be an NHL player, but he's more like a Lance Boma banger type with limited offense. I, I think because of his size and his speed that he should be able to transition, but in a depth role, not a top six. Yeah. I mean, what we really need is like a top six right wing power forward in the mold of, say, Jerome Ginwa. <laughs> but, uh, those girls, yeah. those girl on trees, you know, there's oh, 50 yeah, million absolutely. of those. Even guys. if you look at how many centermen we have, right? I think that we have so many centermen that we're going to have to convert somebody to winger. And I think for some of the centermen we have, um, looking at their talent and their skill set, that wouldn't be hard to do. Yeah, I, I think oh, we'll no. probably see Granlund on, this, on the wing. Um, I think Bennett and Monaghan stay as our, you know, presumptive number one, number two center. Uh, and then, we'll, yeah, we'll see what goes from there. Juris could be a, a winger. Uh, Jankowski can be a... Because of his uh, face-off ability, he would be good to have as a number three center. Sort of in the Martin Hansel style mold. 
Well, almost like Corbin Knight, where he's kind of the face-off guy. Like, he's, you know, not a great, well-rounded center, but he's there because he's the face-off specialist. True. Mm-hmm. Although Jankowski is more well-rounded than Knight was. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, that makes sense. I feel, I'm thinking probably our, our upside on Jankowski, if we get somebody like a Stoll or a Malhotra, somebody who's good on the face-off dot and then can actually play beyond that, too, in a more, like, two-way role. Mm-hmm. You know, I think it's fair. I think if we look at training camp next year and the Flames say, look, we don't have a lot of center positions, but we have wing positions. You want to make this team? Show us you can translate to a winger. Yeah. Uh, one good thing uh, with this all is that the Flames actually only have 45 contract spots available or, or taken. So they have five so spots got- that we can fill. So with the NCAA season ending, Perhaps you can throw a contract at Ati Oxenen, who has been playing on the right wing of uh, Jack Eichel this season, has 22 goals in the NCAA. So there's possibilities of adding to the depth without actually using draft picks as well. Yeah, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if we end up seeing that the Flames have more numbers it would come July 1st. There's some guys here that I really don't think are going to get re-signed. Mark Kandari. <laughs> Mark Kandari is a big one. Like, I, I think at this point, it's a failed experiment. It's time to move on. He was the one I was thinking of. Uh, you know, Kerry Ramos probably not going to be back, so there's a spot. Um, yeah, I, I think that there's there's a couple guys that we probably won't see back here. And, you know, may, maybe for the better, because it lets us go shopping on July 1st. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, Diaz may not be back. He's on a one year. Slemko's on a one year now. So yeah, there's definitely probably a handful of guys we won't see here. And even a guy like Kandari who's an RFA, I don't think they've qualified him yet. So he'll probably end up walking. Um, a couple notes I noticed today as well is some former flames who got traded. I thought it was interesting that there was uh, three or four former flames that got traded. I was saying to you guys before we started, it seems like every trade deadline, Jordan Leopold gets traded. Like, I'm thinking back, and I think every year it seems like Leopold's moving somewhere. And he's a former Flame. I think we've actually acquired him at the trade deadline. Yeah. Uh, did you uh, see the letter that his daughter wrote to the Minnesota Wild prior to them picking him up? Yeah. No, what did it say? It was just basically saying that, uh, that uh, they wanted... Uh, his daughter wanted... Jordan to play there because they live in Minnesota and that Minnesota is having troubles at the time. So, you know, bring my dad in and he'll help the blue line. <laughs> well, and Jordan Leopold also went to the University of Minnesota. That's where I believe where he won his Hobie Baker. So, yeah, he definitely has ties to that market. But he's he's a well-traveled NHLer. He's played for the Flames, the Avalanche, the Flames again, the Panthers, the Penguins, the Sabres, the Blues, the Jackets. Now now the Wild. He's uh he's moved around the league, and you gotta wonder if you're a guy like that. If you're moving that much, is it because everybody wants you, or because nobody wants you? <laughs> Maybe a bit of both. Like I I think I'd start to question. I think I'd start to question. Like okay, it's nice to be traded once in a while because somebody wants you, but after a while, it's like, am I that in demand? Speaking of which, Ole Jokinen landed <laughs> in his 10th NHL destination. <laughs> there you go. He, he, I think he's now on the list of uh, guys most traded. I think 12 is the yeah, highest. Mike so Sillinger, been up there. This is 10th yeah, Mike Sillinger. Mike Sillinger holds the record, so Jokinen's pushing for it. I was kind of hoping Toronto wouldn't find a buyer for him and they'd be stuck with him for the rest of the year just because... I don't know. Just acquiring him so late, I kind of wanted them to be stuck with Jokinen. But he's off to St. Louis now, his 10th team. Do you guys think he's going to make any impact in St. Louis at all? Uh, what do you think, Mike? I would be really surprised. Although it's it's nice for him to not be in Toronto. It's true. And, and he gets reunited with Bowmeister. So, you know, the, the, the two players that have had such difficulties getting in the playoffs will be reuniting for a playoff run. There you go. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think I think Jokinen's days in the NHL are almost numbered. What do you think? Oh yeah, that? I I think this is his last year. He might get another contract, but 
I think it would probably be like a Devin Setaguchi style. Yeah, he's the kind of guy I can see going over to Europe trying to get a payday over there. And the last form of flame really they got traded today was Rennie Bork, who I'm, this always puzzles me. He was free yesterday. He was on waivers. Nobody claims him, and then they trade for him. Like We see that so often. It always puzzles me. Why trade for a guy when you can get him for free? So Bork is off no, to Anaheim uh, he's now, off to Columbus. kind of an interesting... He was on Anaheim. Oh, sorry, right. He was with Anaheim. Yeah, he got traded to Columbus. So off to the Blue Jackets, which I think could be a good market for him. Why not? What do you think, Matt? It, it's good fit? as good of a fit as any. Um, he might be able to rebound similar to Jokin and I think this is his last stop in the NHL so you know it's funny we were talking earlier about Glenn Cross and how you know Mike said he was a player that even the Oilers didn't want when we got him and we were really able to help groom him into a top six and I feel like for every one that we've had like that there's been one like Bork where I think the Flames brought him in saw some potential in him we saw a flash of brilliance, and I think they gave him a lot more rope than they should have, and he never really turned out. And when you look back, I think we got rid of him at just the right time. Yeah, absolutely. Think, um, but yeah, Bork to me is well, a lot like uh, Chris Stewart, like a good player when he puts in the effort, but he n- almost never puts in any effort. Yeah, no, I think I think that's definitely a good way to look at it. And yeah, I mean, we'd see these flash of brilliance of him here, and then he just looked terrible for a couple games. So he was totally inconsistent. And I think that, you know, if you look at what we got back in the Bork deal, we sent him to Montreal and got back uh, Ramo and Camilleri in that deal. So if you think about what we were able to parlay that asset into. And a fifth a rounder, deal. too. Do you remember who we turned the fifth into? Colkin. I don't. Culkin. Ryan yeah, Culkin. Was it? Yeah. Culkin looks pretty good. Yeah. And just for the sake of completeness, we sent prospect Patrick Holland to the Canadians in that, and Holland really yeah. hasn't and done anything. And a second. I don't know who they got with that pick. Fukali. Oh, yeah. okay. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> that evens it out a little bit then. Yeah, but I mean, if you, if you look at Ramo, and you know, I think he was surprised there. They threw him in because they didn't think he was going to be much, and he was over in Russia. So, you know, you can't win every deal. But I think if you look at that long term, they got Fukali. You know, we were able to get Camilleri back, who did some good things here. Um, unfortunately, we weren't able to parlay him into anything else, but that's a, a horse that we've beaten dead already. Just on a quick aside, um, if you want to talk about the teams that got the players with the coolest names, irrespective of playing ability, I'm going to say the big winners today are the Ducks and the Flyers. Flyers actually got a good player, uh, Radko Gudis. Um, but I think that the most hilarious name of the trade deadline going to Anaheim from Toronto, Corbinian Holzer. That's just fantastic. Sounds like a bad James Bond villain. Yeah. Oh, definitely. <laughs> Well, Dallas, uh, they picked up a couple of good names off uh, Detroit. Matthias Backman and Matthias Janmark Nyland. Oh, wow. nice. <laughs> I, I'd hate to be the trainer and ask to figure out how to spell that and stitch it on a jersey. So if we look at the Flames overall haul over the last two days, uh, leaving the team were Sven Berchi and Curtis Glencross. Coming into the team were Dave Schlemko, a second-round pick from Washington, a third-round pick from Washington, and a second-round pick from Vancouver. So if you look at it in those terms, I think that, Mike, I think maybe we're a little bit, maybe it's a little bit better than a 6 out of 10. What do you think? Um. Yeah, well, I mean, it really depends on what we do with those draft picks. Um, because I think, like, we've got good scouting, uh, and so if we go with the guys the scouts want, want I think we do okay. Uh, if we go to the Daryl Sutter school of drafting and just get big Alberta farm boys, then kind of wasted assets. So, I mean, we can't really rank today's deadline until we see who we get back with those draft picks. That's true. That's true. Are there any guys, and I'll start with Matt here. Matt, are there any guys that moved today or didn't move today that you wish the Flames would have brought in? Anybody you, you think that they missed out Not on? Not at all. And, like, if you look at the cost, like, say, uh, Brand, uh, Braden Coburn and uh, Keith Yandel, what they return back in trade, like, I would not have wanted the Flames to spend anywhere near that. And... 
No. There was no good fits. I was worried the Flames might have gone out and done Coburn as kind of a, a move in fear because Glenn Cross was out, but I'm glad, or not Glenn Cross, that Giordano was out and they needed someone on the blue line, but I'm glad they didn't pay the price. Okay, yeah, there was one deal today where I was looking at the assets moved and the return, and the Ducks picked up James Wisniewski in a third for a second, William Carlson, who I, I don't know too much about, and Rene Bork. And if we could have had Wisniewski for a second and a couple of like, you know, prospect slash, you know, bottom six forwards, whatever, then I would have done that deal. If we weren't in such a deep draft year um, with, you know, what looks like a really good top 60, even top 90, depending on who you ask, I wouldn't have been opposed for the, I mean, if you look at what Chris Stewart went for, which is a second, I wouldn't have been opposed if they could have traded straight up bear chief for Stewart. Um, but I think this year we need the draft pick for where we are. But if it was a lousy draft or, you know, it wasn't, we didn't think that we needed that second round as urgently, I would have been okay with that because I think Stewart's a good replacement for uh, Curtis Glencross. Um, yeah, but I would rather have a draft pick than Chris Stewart personally. This year especially, yeah. Any other topics you guys want to chat about this week? Any post-trade deadline stuff or anything else going on with the Flames? I'm good. Why don't we look ahead to the uh, the next week? And Mike, you can play with us this week if you want. We do a competition every week where we take a look at the next week and how we think the Flames are going to do. Uh, if we look back at last week, I thought the Flames would get two points. Matt thought they'd get four points of the total of six. The result was two points. So I'm up again 4-1 in the standings. So, Matt, you got to start catching up. Why don't we let uh, our guest, Mike, predict this week first. Flames have three games or four games on tap. They've got um, tomorrow night, Tuesday night against the Philadelphia Flyers, Thursday night against the Bruins, and Friday's the back-to-back against Detroit. Sunday they play against the Senators. So there's eight points on the table. How many things the Flames are going to take? All right. Well, I'm a Flyers fan, so I'm not going to predict that the Flames beat the Flyers. Uh, Calgary's still my number one team, though, but I like the Flyers. Got a soft spot for them. I don't think we can beat the Bruins, but I think we will go 500 this week, and I, I say we take the Wings and the Senators. So you're thinking four of the eight yeah. points. Two of the four games. I'm going to do the same as Mike, but different games. I'm going to do four points. Um, I think the Flames are going to beat Boston. And I think the Flames are going to beat the Senators. I think they're well rested coming into the Philly game, but I think I just don't think they can make it through Philly. Philly's got a very different play style than we're used to. Um, I think that they'll beat Boston. Boston's on a bit of a slump right now. And I think the Red Wings are going to have our number on the second night of a back-to-back, but I think we can definitely beat the Sens. So I'm going to go four points, half of the games this week, and hopefully we can end this road trip somewhat respectably. Yeah. <laughs> 500 would be good. This is a not particularly easy week. And it's do or die right now, too. Yeah. It's weird because we come home, we play Anaheim, Toronto, then we're back on the road for one game, then we're back here for five games. It's kind of a weird month. But yeah, after the seven game uh, road stand, it'll be nice because we pretty much have one, two, three, four, five, six home games. So hopefully we'll get some more points. But yeah, Anaheim's a tough opponent to come home to. Yep. Well, guys, it's been fun. It's been an interesting day for the deadline. I'm not surprised by the moves, and I called it last week. I said I think a prospect's going to get moved. Um, it wasn't Berchi I was thinking of, but I guess in the end he's a prospect, right? Do you think it would be fair to say at this point this will probably be the summer of defensemen for the Flames, be it through draft or free agency or trade, that they're probably coming in focusing on defense? I think that's a reasonable assumption to make. They kind of have to, don't yeah, they, Yeah, I, I think so. But at the same time, at the draft, you want best player available. So if that means we take six left wingers, which I hope isn't the case, but if there are six amazing left wingers in the draft, then that's who you take. Uh, we'll see what happens. There's a lot of defensemen this year. Yeah. So hopefully some of those guys will be the best player available. All right, gentlemen. Well, let's sign off. And uh, Matt and I will be back next week for more Flames Talk. But enjoy the week. Enjoy kind of the post-trade deadline glow and let's hope the flames don't lose too badly this week yeah have a good week guys fireside chat is edited by mike crosby and brett bauer this show is licensed under creative commons license for full license information visit 
fireside chat.ca.